Welcome to Ensuring Success 2019. We're so glad you could join us today. Um, some of you, I'm sure, have been here for many hours. Some of you are new. Um, we do apologize for the fact that we're starting a little bit after the hour, but we had a little bit of a technology hiccup this morning, and uh, it's the beauty of live broadcast. You know, you just take what comes your way. So that's what we did. So it threw us off on our schedule. So you may have come in and seen a little bit of last session, which was fine. And uh, we are now starting session seven on the itinerary, which is be a better auditing advisor, how current trends are impacting the auditing process. I'm Gail Perry, editor in chief of CPA Practice Advisor Magazine. And I would like to thank all of our sponsors who are making this event possible for us. So I'm gonna read their names off really quickly. Um, and they are into it. Gusto, Canopy, Avalara, Sage, BQE Core, eFileForBiz.com, Paychex, CPA.com, ADP, Zero, Chase Inc., and Walters Kluwer. And we would particularly like to thank Walters Kluwer because they are the sponsor of this specific session. Um, also, I would like to give you just a brief uh, summary on how to handle CPE for this session. So if you're new and haven't, if this is your first session today, <clears throat> excuse me. The way we um, verify your attendance is we will produce three codes at the, uh, during the session. They'll appear at the bottom of the screen. I'll call attention to each of them to make sure that you're looking at the screen and I'll want you to write down those codes. So at the end of the day when you're finished with all your sessions, you'll click the CPE tab at the top of the screen and you'll enter the codes that you got for every session you attended and that's how you'll get your CPE. If you need to reach us for any reason during the day today, it's info at ensuringsuccess.com. If you're having any kind of screen difficulty, we had a little blip a little bit earlier, just hit the refresh key on your screen and that should take care of that problem. You can find us on social media at hashtag December, C December CPE, hashtag December CPE. So I hope you're using that. Feel free to tweet about us or say something on any of your favorite social media platforms. We'll be glad to have the visibility. Um, right now, I'm gonna uh, move over to our session guests, our panel participants, and I'll introduce them briefly by name and then have, the, have you tell them, uh, have them tell you, it's getting late in the day, have them tell you a little bit about themselves. So we have today Garrett Wagner and Chris Gino and Kathy Rowe. So Garrett. Want to start? Garrett Wagner, I am the CEO and founder of C3 Evolution Group, and we provide innovative solutions to today's CPA firms. And as always, Gail, I'm super excited to be back here. I know I've been doing some social media posting live behind the scenes, Thank so you. now I'm excited to be in front of the camera right. for a little bit. <laughs> this is my first time here. I'm Chris Gino. I work for uh, Savile Dodgen here in Dallas. I have been an insurance manager for several years now and have been, been in audit and in insurance practice for about a decade. <laughs> All right, and I'm Kathy Rowe. I'm the Director of Product Management with Walters Kluwer, uh, really owning our audit strategy. So I love having these conversations with uh, other practitioners to really understand how we can shape our strategy to help you guys be more efficient and drive audit of the future and be a better advisor. Excellent. So, and also, Gail, Kathy's being very modest here. Kathy is the Walters Kluwer Tax and Accounting Global Innovation winner. She just won that award. So we've got a celebrity here. Yeah. Yeah. Global Thank innovation. You. So we really are right on point talking about the future of the audit and what it means to be an advisor. That's excellent. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. So at Walters Kluwer, we were always trying to be innovative and it's kind of an internal um, thing like Shark Tank, we'll say, that we're trying to move the needle on, on innovation to deliver to the profession. So we're really curious to find out during the session what kind of innovations are going to be impacting auditing going forward. Um, but I'm going to just start out with the, the big question that's on a lot of people's minds. Are audits going away? Well, I think, you know, long, long term audits were going to absolutely change. They're not going to go away, but the way we do an audit today, like, you know, a substantive procedure audit, looking at accounts receivable, accounts payable, setting out confirmations, 
that's not going to be a thing going forward. I think that's an absolute. I don't think there's anybody out there today that says, in 10 years, we're going to do the exact same thing we do today. So the shift is coming, and it's all about how do we get ready for it, and how do we adapt to that change and find new opportunities. Right, and that's taking some of the information that's available today and really applying it in analytically, like you said, moving away from substantive procedures and into those analytical procedures of really understanding and diving into the data that's there to give you an opportunity to project and predict those balances that you'd expect. You're not going to, like you mentioned, you're not going to need to confirm anymore because some of that stuff is going to be just be there as a, as a known. You're going to be more focused on things that require judgment and things that require those next level or upper, upper level uh, levels of education and levels of thought um, that, that today you don't spend not quite as much time on. And so going forward, I think that you'll see that the professional move toward that. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I do think that technology may take some jobs away, um, but I think that's also an opportunity for firms to bring in a new skill set to further enable us to be more strategic, trusted advisor, to deliver, being able to leverage that uh, the data to find more value within the audit for your clients. Right. So um, there are several, Several ways we can approach this, but I think one of the areas is um, we've talked about uh, whether um, or how you can avoid impairing independence by moving into more of an advisory practice while still being an auditor. auditor. And I think that uh, a lot of firms are approaching that in different ways. So what are you seeing and what, what are the issues involved with that? Yeah, so I can start there. I mean, I just came from the PCOB conference where this was a big issue in 2019, um, where the firms are moving more in towards advisory. So it is a really gray area um, that you know firms are getting in trouble. So I think that is something that we need to be careful about. You know, what I'm seeing is that clients are expecting firms to add more value as part of their audit. In addition, you know, in addition to just providing financial reports, they want to see visualization, how they're doing against their pairs. Um, so it's a matter of how can you do that and still remain independent is something that we're, you know, we're working with firms on. Right, sure. And there are so many different things that, that people want advice on. There's lots of areas that you, that you need extra advice and that you need to be able to to provide that value to your clients to say, here's the thing you need to be thinking about. Oftentimes it's more that direction of this is this is an area where, where you need assistance. It may be connecting to some other partner that does that or, or connecting them to another area of your entity. So keeping them separate as you have an assurance practice and you have a separate, completely separate practice where your your people are segregated and and, and you you can really provide that extra value through a collaborative team. Mm -hmm. And it's also something just as firms we got to really just think about and be proactively to think about every day. If we're going to provide some other service to an audit client, what is it? Where does it fall? And it's also something, as Kathy said, is there's a lot of like ambiguity there. So a lot of services, there's not a hard line that like these 10 advisory services you can do and not be independent, and these 10 you can't. There's still a lot of judgment and kind of like what's mm -hmm. still that, it's still that same question, what impairs management's independence? And are we making a management decision? It's still a gray area, but so it's something... You got to this farm. Think about it. Ask questions. Document your file. And mm -hmm. if you need to call another expert, do it. Don't just sit there with blinders on and say we'll be fine, and just wait for the shoe to drop. So, you mentioned that some firms are getting into trouble, um, and or they're they're crossing over whatever that line is that's not really very clear. What kind of examples can you share about what firms are doing that's getting them into trouble? Yeah, so I don't have the specific examples. No, um, but just I, in, in general. Yeah, yeah, so I think it would be um, like if they're noticing that maybe they're looking at their internal controls and then advising them and kind of overstepping that and telling them mm -hmm. how to fix them and, and getting in there and doing it themselves uh, versus just identifying it and giving it to somebody else within the firm or another firm to address. Right, or giving it back to management. Uh, like like Garrett mentioned, it's, it, it does take a lot of of making sure that you aren't taking the place of management, that you aren't making those decisions. And that, that's really what's critical, exactly. I think, is that, is that you can make sure to draw that distinction of this is, a man, this is management's decision and they are doing what they need to be doing mm -hmm. and we are, we are just providing advice, not doing the work. Exactly. I yeah. mean, another example is, you know, when you're auditing publicly 
trade of fi uh, cut financial statements, the financial statements are supposed to be those of the company, not created by mm -hmm. the accounting firm. So that's another perfect example. Yeah, and another great thing too for especially smaller firms that want to get into advisory services, they might not be able to do those advisory services themselves. So it's a great time to partner with somebody else. Let somebody else do that true advisory service. You stay independent and your clients get that better service. Instead of you doing a mediocre job of both, continue to do the audit, remain independent, bring an out, outstanding third party in to do that service, and it's a win-win for your client and for your firm. Well, that's an interesting um, separation, I think, because a lot of firms are embracing client accounting services and going mm -hmm. more all in, being outsourced CFOs to their clients, and, and really, and probably preparing the financial statements and doing um, the day-to-day -day accounting processes and I think I assume it's pretty obvious that those people can't do the audit of the same firm that they're doing that for but but can firms do that can firms make enough of a separation that they'll be accepted as auditors if another part of their firm is doing the accounting services I mean I think it's very important that you're, you're really careful about that mm -hmm. um, I don't know. The, I don't know the right answer, uh, but I know that that's something you'd really want to evaluate, and that you'd want to make a decision as a firm: mm -hmm. is this something that we'd be comfortable with? Uh, a lot of times, that that line is going to be is going to be too overstepped, I'd think. Um, but you want to be you want to be careful about it, and you certainly want to be thoughtful about it. Mm -hmm. and it's also important to remember that the line for the PCAOB versus the rest of auditing standards no, is different. True. The PCAOB line is even more clear and even more wide and broad, mm -hmm. where non-PCAOB audits there's a lot more gray. Mm -hmm. So it's also not just clear cut across the board, it's what type of audit are you doing, then what are the rules that fit that? I wonder, and I'm just off the top of my head, is there any situation uh, arising where um, firms that want to do both are doing client accounting services for auditing clients of other firms and those firms are doing the cash services for the firms that you're auditing, that kind of a trade? You know, I don't know of any exact examples. That sounds like uh, my a great firm, idea. my firm, yeah, it does sound like a great <laughs> idea. Our firm doesn't do that right now, uh, but it does sound like a very, a very good opportunity to, mm -hmm. especially if you have a, a trusted partner that you could use in that way, mm -hmm. um, to, to reference back and forth. I know we're part of a, a global gr group and network of firms, and so we do occasionally transfer some of that business when we, when we feel like we've overstepped that area where we wouldn't be independent anymore. Right. We may refer to one of our network partners or our, our global group partners, um, and so I think. That that, that that can be one way to do that, um, and finding those types of firms locally too can be uh, can be something because a, a lot of times your clients aren't going to want to talk to a firm that's in a different city or that's in a that's in a different state. Um, so being able to uh, being able to find somebody close that that sounds like a great opportunity, <laughs> something that something worth reaching out about for sure. And we're seeing that driver from especially like the the big top ten CPA firms where they're finding a true independence problem and they look at it from a business case. Okay, we're charging maybe hundred thousand dollars for the audit. We can charge $400,000 for the advisory services, and we're making way more per hour than the advisory services. So what are we going to do? We're going to ditch that audit, and it can go out to whoever. Maybe we have a relationship, maybe we don't, but we're just abandoning that client on that side because we're making more in the advisory services. It's more profitable. And when we see what happens time and time again, that just washes its way down. Mm -hmm. The top 10 do it. The top 100 do it. The top 300. And it goes down to the smallest firm. It's just that waterfall effect. So what we're seeing that in the future of the audit Watch what the big four do, it's gonna eventually hit the smaller firms. I mean, I think one way to look at it is to be more efficient on audit is to look at how you can leverage technology to drive efficiencies and qualities mm -hmm. so that you can still do you know, some of that audit business at the same time and, and create value for your client as part of the audit. Not necessarily advisory, but be able to share more and have a better audit for that client and the stakeholders that are relying on it. Right. So we hear talk of 100% audits. Mm -hmm. Technology is moving in and doing all the, the work that nobody really enjoyed, frankly, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> so, um, so what does that mean for the future of audits in terms of you know, what, what do we do with the data that's coming out of uh, a situation where um, Watson or a computer system is doing uh, an analysis of all, or at least a, of an examination of all of the transactions. 
Yeah, I mean, there's a definite shift from moving from sampling to looking at 100% of the data. And I think there's a few reasons why. One is efficiency. Uh, being able to use technology to do that will help. Um, but th what I'm seeing is, um, so the efficiencies of driving the audit, as well as the audit profession is clearly advocating for that. They have a whole initiative, the AICPA, around modernizing the accounting standards. Um, their first focus area is all around audit evidence, being able to make sure that the audit evidence is reliable and relevant, and using technology to look at 100% of the data to capture anything that might be they, the auditor might have missed before. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's critical that, that firms move in that direction and, and embrace it. And it's also one of those ones, too, that it's ultimately going to be, what does a standard study body say we have to do? Mm. You know, because we're seeing technology move so fast right now, and even just talking to Kathy before we went on stage, the stuff that she's doing at Walter School is really, really impressive, and it's moved, they're moving faster than the standard setting body are. Mm -hmm. So how do they kind of catch up and provide guidance? And like you said, 100% audit is going to happen. What does it look like? Well, the sooner we can hear from those bodies, like, what it looks like, <laughs> the sooner we get ready for it, because right now we're all just guessing. Like, we can all say, well, it's going to look like this, and you should do this. Until FASB and the PCAB come out and say, here are the new auditing standards, that's what we really need. Mm -hmm. But I think the fundamentals of the standards aren't going to change. Like, they're still saying that you need to get the confidence in, in the financial statements and the audit, and how do you do mm -hmm. that? You need to get reliable audit evidence. So they're mm -hmm. providing the, the profession more capabilities and more flexibility to how you can do that and not limiting yourself anymore. So I actually think that it's not going to change fundamentally, but mm. will give the profession more flexibility. So when we talk about 100% audits or technology taking over a lot of the audit process, I think the thought process is that that's kind of right now anyway for the big firms. Mm -hmm. How are smaller firms that do audits being able to leverage technology to improve their processes? I think that's one of the most interesting parts of this is not only is there a lot of technology out there, it's also incredibly affordable. So the same kind of futuristic AI audit technology the big four are using, a solo practitioner can afford today. So there used to be that huge barrier to entry, and now everybody can get into it. And now mm -hmm. it's on them to look at, like Kathy was talking about, follow the audit, audit evidence rules and apply some new technology there to gain some efficiencies, but technology has really leveled the playing field. And we're seeing that right away on the next generation of audit technology. Yeah, and I think it's important for each firm to evaluate what's best for them. There, there, are, there are a wide variety of different options that are out there that, that can give you different, each have a different capacity and capability. And so identifying the one that helps you to serve your clients best can really be really valuable because there, there are so many choices. You, you want to really pick that one that is really the one that, that lets you do exactly what you want to do as you tailor your audit approach to, to, to meet your goals. Yeah, I mean, my feeling is that uh, an auditor's best friend is Excel, and Excel <laughs> is really powerful. Um, and so we've introduced some technologies such as Teammate Analytics that works with Excel because our philosophy is we want to empower auditors to be able to use technology, whether you're a super big firm or a small firm, and that will help them do that in a tool that's really familiar with them. Yeah. So, um, what kind of critical challenges are out there when we talk about the technology and how it's changing audits? You know, I think it really the critical challenge is the mindset shift from um, audits is a very like checklist procedural type of process. You know, we've always done it like a step one risk assessment. We talked about it, like right. audit cash, receivables, payables, and you go through a very methodical, repetitive process to now be more, use these tools and be more of an advisor, be more creative in it. Like really understand what drives these changes and trends. Look at that, and then how do you find audit evidence that fits that in an analytical way? Which is a very much more creative, outside the box thinking versus, okay, step one, like confirm cash. Step two, like deposits in transit, outstanding checks. Like it used to be mm -hmm. very, very structured. Yeah. And now it's becoming a lot more open-ended. And that lends into how do we be better advisors to our clients? It's that same thought process, thinking what we can do to be efficient and help our clients. Yeah, and I think that there's there's an, there's another thing too. We, we talk a lot about the technology that's available to auditors, 
but our clients are also having exposure to a lot of new technologies. And so as auditors, we need to understand how those technologies are impacting their accounting systems, how that's impacting the audit evidence that we are getting. Mm -hmm. And so that, that can be a big challenge. It's definitely something that would be, that'll be newer and, and you'll need a different set of expertise potentially to understand how those systems are communicating and where that data is coming from. And so you can know whether that is reliable audit evidence or whether it's just some garbage that got put into a system and got spit out. And so it is, it'll be really important not only to understand the tools that we have, but to understand the tools that our clients have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, a few other challenges that I see professionals uh, faced with is just even getting the data from their clients to do this data-driven audit. So being able to capture 100% of the data versus uh, the bits and pieces. So it's getting that data and the entire client collaboration throughout, getting you know client readiness uh, to support your audit in a timely way when you're juggling so many different things. Um, the other major trend that I'm seeing is all around audit quality. Mm -hmm. So making sure that you're doing risk assessment according to the standards and having a quality audit plan uh, while still being efficient and being profitable. So I think that's a real key balance thing to. And that's an importance too there, like just the whole idea of client collaboration, like thinking ahead of time, how do we get the data better so we start on the right foot? And because there's so much data from the client from the general ledger software to supporting documents. How do we get that efficiently? Is there a way to think about your audit? In the past, it was just thinking about like, well, how do I audit cash? Now it's like, how do I start with to make it more efficient and get all those documents, as well as just how do we get it securely? You know, right. so many clients we have send us stuff just through the email, through a text message, and it's not secure. You gotta kind of pause, slow down, remind them, listen, you just exposed all of your data right. to identity right. theft. We don't want to be responsible for that. We want to get in a secure way. But once again, the data is also so big, you can't just email it you got to deal with multiple facets, but it's this new thing to think about being proactive in audits. How do you grow it? Start right. up front, bring and it, it in. It doesn't just impact the auditors. The shift has to happen on the client side too. Yeah. They need to be comfortable with giving you all the data and mm. giving you access to it. Uh, so that shift, while they're still their technology is changing, they they need to shift in in terms of how they work with us. Yeah. All right, we're going to um, take a quick little break here. Uh, actually, I think all I have to do is announce CPE. We don't have a commercial break at this point. So if you would look at the bottom of your screen, please, the first CPE code for this session should be appearing. You'll want to write that code down and then uh, save it, and we'll get two more codes to you during the course of this session. All three of those will go together to make your, uh, to create your CPE certificate for this session. So, um, Let's talk a little bit about analytics. Okay. <laughs> Good topic. Yes, I, yeah. <laughs> where, where do you want to go with analytics? Yeah, yeah, let's, just broad. let's start with what do, we, what do we think of when we talk about analytics? Do well, you want to you yeah, give us the formal sure. definition? Yeah. yeah. Put you on the spot? Uh, let's see. Let's see if I can remember what the formal definition is. I think, uh, I think analytics are typically uh, identifying predictable relationships to, to give you an expectation for what an ending balance or account uh, should kind of look like. And so that's taking, taking some information that's out, that can be outside of the information system, um, applying some metric, whatever it may be, to, uh, to historical balances or to current activity, and coming up with an expectation for here's, here's what the end result is, this is what we would expect to see, and then doing some evaluation of whether uh, the underlying data agrees with that expectation. And then, of course, whether it does or not, that is the, that's the next step you have to go through of, of extra evaluation. And so with all of the information and data that's available, the ability and power of those analytics can really, really, really be expanded. And as data becomes more available and more robust, we'll have even more opportunities to be able to use that in a way that can really, really be helpful in our audits. Like we've talked about, that you can take the information and manipulate it in ways that you couldn't before because there are so many extra and new tools there that, that allow you that opportunity to just be able to parse it down in a way that, that can really be powerful. And so it's a, for me personally, it's a super exciting thing that's coming in the field is there's so much data out there that you can use benchmarking tools and other sets of clients that are very similar to, to give you a very, very powerful idea of what you should be expecting in your audit. And that can help, help you as the auditor to gain so much efficiency because you can take the data that's there, 
apply some expectation to it based on your knowledge and your understanding of that business and, and come up with a really, really solid understanding of what that should look like, which will really give you the ability to identify whether you have problems in the, in the financial records. Yeah, I think analytics is hugely important. The AICPA put out a data analytics guide just a few years ago, and it was really advocating to, to drive efficiencies and quality, but also to use it as a visualization tool to help support better client collaboration um, and their client meetings for the communication. Um, but also, when you read through that guide, it talks a lot about how you can use analytics throughout the entire audit. So starting with risk assessment, right through the substantive analytical procedures. And I think that's a shift and hasn't really happened yet in, in a lot of cases. But being able to do analytics to identify risky transactions will drive a higher quality, more fine-tuned audit plan, and that's really critical to move forward. Yeah, I mean, analytics are, are such a big part, and firms really haven't embraced them yet. A lot of firms do analytics, but they're not really strong. It's really about, you know, you can't leverage all this technology if step one, you can't design a really thought-out, intelligent analytic. You know, once again, you can do substantive tests, or you can do analytical tests, and both can be powerful, but analytics usually are take less time. Sure. So you've got to do an intelligent one with that. So really spending some time, you know, if you haven't read that guide on analytics, you should read that guide. You should, as a firm, uh, have someone inside your firm that understands how to do analytics. What's a good analytic? What provides sufficient audit evidence to reduce substantive testing? So you can do the audit more efficiently. So Chris, like for you, what kind of you know, analytics are you guys doing inside your firm? So we, uh, we do them in lots of places. I think the, the place that you see it most often is going to be on your income statement. Historically, those balance sheet balances are ones that we, we've typically relied on, those substantive tests, those yeah. detailed tests. And so looking at expenses and, and evaluating the, the, the different components of those expenses, because there are a lot of different drivers out there that can specifically drive your expenses that can, that can help you to build a very, very powerful Expectation, and so you you can, and we we do uh, in in several different spots. Uh, parse down our income statement data to to different drivers and different uh, different components that that can be or should be easy to predict. And so we we uh, we use that as often as we can. We're trying to pick up those efficiencies from being able to spend less time doing those detail tests and picking out those specific transactions where we can test a big balance all through one little analysis versus. 10 or 15 or 20 different specific tests. Yeah, I mean, we've seen firms just start with journal entry testing using mm -hmm. analytics software like Teammate Analytics um, in Excel to do, to do that. Um, sampling uh, using the analytics software to do that or or even looking at uh, to identify risky transactions like what uh, transactions happen on a weekend, just little things like that to really help fine tune fine tune your work. So I think there's a lot of opportunities to introduce it. Is it possible to provide some examples of what what a difference it makes in like, without naming any companies or anything, but in a real life situation where you're doing an audit of a firm and have these new tools available? Yeah, we, we actually at Walters Clover, we have what's called audit talks where we do podcasts with other firms and we just uh, did one last week. and. They said that when they introduced teammate analytics, as an example, it shaved three and a half days off of their audit using Benford's analysis um, for the same work that they used to do manually. So that's pretty significant. Yeah. And then when they showed their client what they were able to do with this analysis, their client actually bought teammate analytics. So that was really interesting <laughs> because, because that's the thing. Like they want to be able to help their client and their client wants that kind of help all year long. So seeing the capabilities, um, the client can just do it themselves in lots of cases. Yeah, and really no matter what the job is, whether it's big or small, you know, you can test accounts payable in the detailed test and you might find one or two things wrong, but you're not providing much insight there. If you can provide some analytics, especially with the data you can do like Benford's Law, you can really find some interesting things that the client might not realize. Once again, we're adding value a different way. We're starting to think like an advisor and not just a te technician mm -hmm. every day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the other thing that I, I'm seeing that firms are looking for in terms of analytics is there's a rich amount of data within 
their engagement binders mm -hmm. and they want to be able to access it. So building out client scorecards to use it at the end of the audit to sit down when you're having the final meeting uh, to use that as visualization, but also then for the advisory arm of the of the firm to mm -hmm. be able to build out kind of client firm scorecards looking at how uh, this client may compare to the rest of the industry looking for new opportunities to help clients. So there's mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, even on an analytical standpoint for a client in terms of like revenue testing, you can get pretty granular in Excel very, very efficiently mm -hmm. and look at like sales by day, week, month, sales yeah. by product line, graph it out, make it pretty, use it to help audit evidence, and like you said, present it back to the client. Just so you know, of your six product lines, these two are not very yeah. good at all. <laughs> these two are your winners, and like here's the cycle of it, right? and a lot of them yeah. don't realize that. Right, and, and I, I think that's a big thing too, is they really don't realize mm -hmm. that. And there is so much, so much information out there that, yeah. that when, you, when you are able to take the, take the information and parse it in a way that makes sense and, mm -hmm. can, and can be predictive, uh, when, you, when you see something that's outstanding, it, it, it comes out pretty clear and it's, and it's pretty obvious. And then you can, you can go back to your client and say, did you know that this was happening? To, to make sure either, number one, whether this was something that was unusual, mm -hmm. or, or just to help to advise and say, here's something you need to think about because this is obviously happening to you because it's sticking out in, in these analysis that we're mm -hmm. doing. Yeah, and I, I think it story tells what a million right. words. <laughs> yeah. um, being able to take this visualization and put it on the, the wall of your team planning meeting will help educate all of the audit team, not just have that knowledge sitting with the partner. So I think that will help move the needle on quality too. And I was thinking the same thing as he was talking as well, kind of the, one of the prior sessions today talked about communication and you know, how do you tell a story versus like giving them this big, like thick report, like here's the data, here's a bunch of analysis, you don't understand, the client doesn't understand. How do you instead tell a meaningful story around that data, yeah. and talk to them like a real person yeah. so they can walk away and be like, okay, I actually understand what Kathy said to me and what this <laughs> means to my business and how I need to make changes. Once again, that does our role shifting from auditor, technician to the to advisor. Right. Talk to your clients, really communicate to them, and storytelling is a great way to do that. I think they talked a lot about that in maybe one of the earlier sessions. Yeah, um, and we've tried to actually to incorporate some storytelling in each session, but absolutely, okay. when you're um, when you can give real life examples and real mm -hmm. stories of something, people are more likely to relate to it, no matter what the setting is. So, um, and and so speaking of that, um, so we've talked about using the data that we can get through these much more comprehensive audits. Mm -hmm. But that's the company's data. How about taking that outside and what kind of trends are we seeing in terms of being able to do benchmarking in comparison to the rest of the industry? I think that there's, there is just so much more information out there and there are so many tools already that, that exist that allow you to see those benchmarks um, that, that you, you can know pretty powerfully whether an AP balance is too small, or whether a revenue number is too large, just by being able to look at what other companies in that industry are doing. Uh, we, we in one of our audits, did something like that to do a, a cost of sales analysis, because our, our company was a very, a very generic type company. It did, did a thing that a lot of companies do, uh, and so we we. Took the took several of their their uh, guideline public company types, uh, their their competitors in the market, and said, "Well, here's what they all do. How how do we compare to them?" And and you could that could highlight, or in our case, it actually it actually supported very clearly that they were in the right space and that they were where where we kind of would have expected them to be. And then and then and if there was some opportunity for it to be outside of that, um, it again just like it, just like with other things, it may highlight it pretty clearly as. Your competitors are all doing this. This is either A, an opportunity for you to improve because you're outside of what your competitors are doing. You may be able to do this better. Or it may highlight an advantage that they have is what are you doing here that's so powerful that's really, really giving you this advantage? Or, of course, unfortunately, sometimes it, you may highlight a problem um, because it may be that they, they've just done it incorrectly. <laughs> Yeah, and one thing that we were talking about earlier that we see where Audit of the Future is going, where really it starts today, is to have this data-driven audit. But data can come, like we said, from GL transactions and subledgers. Um, it can come from just client-submitted documents. But then there's er other external documents, whether it's other external clients or, or other things on the internet uh, that need to be considered. So really the goal is to be able to feed that into the audit for more predictive analysis, being able to predict risks uh, for the auditor to consider and really fine tune their professional judgment. So I think that's really where where it's going in the future. Yeah, and I, and I think that that's a really, really, really good point too. Is that 
as you start to get more information and you start to get those better benchmarking tools, you'll be able to identify pretty clearly at the beginning of your audit where you might have problems because that, that's going to highlight in the industry, this is happening. And in the, in the industry, you should be expecting this. And so you can, you can go from the very beginning of your audit to identify those areas of risk and those opportunities for you to tailor those procedures in a way that's really going to use your time efficiently and powerfully. Yeah. You know, and also with benchmarking, while there are more data available publicly, we still need not forget inside our own firms, we have a ton of benchmarking data already. Like we already deal with clients in a geographic mm -hmm. region. Mm -hmm. We might have a niche in healthcare manufacturing or, or one of the firms I work for, we did a ton of credit union audits. So we could build a ton of credit union data benchmark analytics ourselves. Because mm -hmm. we did about 50 credit union audits, so we had enough data to really predict out, oh, yeah. here's what we expect to see in the geographical area the different loans, the savings balances. Well, here's what's happening in upstate New York. So we expect dip in the economy. We expect them to go down. And these are the differences. So really don't forget about the benchmarking data, what you have inside internally. Yeah, and actually sometimes that's even more relevant than what you can buy with third-party tools because yeah. it's uh, sometimes there's anomalies that throw that off in mm -hmm. other parts of that region. Mm -hmm. um, and being able to, when we move audit onto the access platform, we will have all that data to allow firms just kind of slice and dice and filter. Um, so for sure that's part of our vision and strategy. And also with benchmarking, we've got to remember public benchmarking data isn't always perfect. Right. You know, you really got to watch out for, there is no guarantee for a lot of them that data is accurate. It's what's submitted. Uh, you know, there are a couple of analytical tools that auditors have used in the past, and you know, one in particular, it pulled data from different CPA firms, which was nice, but it raised the question, like, how right was all of that data? Like, yeah, there's 100 data points, but I'm not sure if all those data points are accurate, or if that's just what a firm put in when they're playing around, you know, in planning before they made the journal entries, and it's materially wrong. They never bothered to clean it up because... And I think the other thing it comes down to, how standardized is the data? So yeah. when we bring it in, we're planning on having it in a standardized fashion. Mm -hmm. And to be able oh, to nice. be comparable, that's a key issue, yeah. is that it needs to be apples to apples. Certainly, if you're purchasing third-party data, you're mm -hmm. not going to... How do you know? How, how, will you, yeah. how would you ever get a, a precise match of what you're looking for? Exactly. Yeah. So we should take a little break here. Um, we're going to learn a little bit about our sponsor, Walters mm. Kluwer. And then when we come back, you'll get your second CPE code for this section, for this session. So please don't go away, and we'll be back in about a minute or two. So everything we do, we begin with our customers in mind. Using contextual design principles, we immerse our product teams into our customers' workflows to better understand their specific needs and where processes can be improved using our solutions. The collaborative process of gathering data, taking that back to our innovations lab for input to our solution design and product roadmaps ensures that we've captured the voice of our customers and are delivering real value. As a technology-driven firm, we love using CCH Access Tax because they really simplify our workflow and let us know exactly where the tax return is in the entire process. With technology advancing at such a rapid pace, uh, firms really have a fantastic opportunity to really transform how they're performing audits and advisory services. The efficiency that can be driven from an integrated approach that saves all the information across an entire database, across an entire audit methodology is, is key. And it's, it's really an important thing that a lot of you know, the other firms, larger firms, smaller firms, really work towards because that's the most efficient way to do it. It's also the most effective way to do it. Built on a service-oriented architecture on the cloud, our open integration platform enables customers to combine their internal and external program data and client interactions into a seamless workflow. It goes beyond improving processes and productivity. We're able to help customers mine insights from data to add value to their client interactions. We're solving complex problems together in a way that's truly exciting. Welcome back. 
please look at the bottom of the screen and you should see your second CPE code for this session. So be sure to write that down. Uh, place it with the other one we already gave you and there'll be one more coming and those will be your three codes to verify your attendance for this session so you can get CPE credit. So um, one of the things we've talked about when we were preparing for this session was um, to make the, the one of the, the trends or the changes we're seeing in the profession has to do with the area of peer review and making sure you're ready for peer, re peer review and how with audits changing, how that's impacting the whole um, concept of peer review. So let's hear what, what uh, is happening in that arena. So one of the really big things they want you to think about from a compliance standpoint, how do we do a more intelligent audit like we've talked about, is really start with risk assessment. You know, risk assessment's been around for 10 to 15 years now, and most firms do a very, very basic, broad approach. They don't do a lot of thought into it. They don't get very specific, and that's a big focus on peer review. Are you doing a client-specific risk assessment? Are you really looking at assessing inherent risk at the individual assertion level, not just the account balance level. And that's something that all firms got to start to do because it starts with that planning phase. How do you do a more efficient audit? How do you use analytics? How do you know when to use analytics? It starts at risk assessment. You can't just start doing analytics mm -hmm. and get you to mediocre risk assessment because you're not sure what to do or where to do it. Risk assessment is your guiding direction for it. So they want to see an increased focus from firms, how to be a better auditor, be way better at risk assessment, and assess risk at a more detailed assertion level. Yeah, and there's no question that being able to do that will provide you audit value because like you mentioned, if you don't know where your risks are going to be, then you have no idea how you're going to plan to address them. And so if you're if you have all of this data, it's not it's not any good if you're not using it to address the risk that you have. And so starting there, spending just a little bit of time in thinking about those specific things, like what does the data tell me is wrong with this client or where should I speci specifically expect to have problems, being able to tailor that so, so narrowly uh, can really, really give you a, and more efficiency. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, um, Garrett mentioned that the risk assessment standards have been out for 10 to 15 years, so why now, why, why the change? And I think, you know, we've worked pretty closely with the Enhancing Audit Quality Initiative with the AICPA, and what they have found by doing reviews of the peer reviews is that people just don't understand the risk assessment standards this mm -hmm. long after. So when they went and go, like they did this review of, of the peer review and the audits, they found out that you know people aren't adding specific risks. They aren't assessing risk at the assertion level. They're not linking it. They're just doing the cookie cutter checklists. Um, mm -hmm. And that really needs to change. So what they really have done about that is they've updated the peer review manual last year and so for the next three years starting last year they're really um, giving firms the chance to make the change in this specific area around risk assessment um, so they they will um, not fail them on their peer review but they'll mm -hmm. they'll require action mm -hmm. and you know the problem before though is just to expand a bit more is that peer reviewers themselves weren't necessarily catching these things because they weren't trained mm -hmm. themselves. Mm -hmm. So they've really reformed that whole peer review process and have retrained the peer reviewers so now that they have a much more in-depth checklist to follow as well when they're going through it. Mm. And it even starts with something most almost as basic as, okay, risk assessment, assess the risk at the assertion level, like do you know what the five or seven assertions, depending on the methodology, can you name the assertions, because if you can't even name those and assertions. And what do they mean? Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> so do you want to you you be on the spot here and tell us all five assertions, what they mean? Yeah, I'm OK. <laughs> Chris, do you want to feel that one? Uh, you know, I really don't. Uh, probably could. Uh, but there are, it, is, it is important to be thinking yeah. about them on, on an account level, because some accounts are going to have different assertions that matter. And some yes. clients, just by the nature of your client, you may know that some, some area that for one client is going to be a risk one direction, for another client, because of the way they keep their books, it may be a risk in the opposite direction. And that's why tailoring those risk assessment procedures are so important, because that helps you then respond to that risk by designing the right procedure. Exactly, and, and I, we had a good conversation with the AICPA about this. Um, a firm said, one of the questions that came in on a panel that we were doing was, 
wow, I have so much more work to do. How am I ever going to be efficient and profitable on this engagement? You know, we run a business here. <laughs> um, but their point was that you're actually doing a more tailored audit. Mm -hmm. uh, so you don't need to do all the procedures that you were doing before. You actually need to develop this stronger understanding, spend more time up front, and then tailor your engagement and make that direct linkage from why you're doing what you're doing. So you actually could probably audit faster, but smarter. And this is something me and Chris were talking about before yeah. the session, kind of talking about some of these topics. You know, one of the biggest audits programs, substantive tests, search for unrecorded liabilities. Right. We all don't like doing it. <laughs> but you can assess the risk at the assertion level with materiality, and you could not do a search for unrecorded liabilities and be completely fine with peer review. That's going to save you a whole bunch of time. Exactly. Certainly could, yep. But you've got to go through the process up front of, like, what are the risks? Like you said, is it overstatement or understatement? Those are two different risks tested in two different ways. Yeah. If you don't understand that, maybe accounts payable search doesn't matter. It's not going to deem anything material. Yeah, it's absolutely a big thing, especially in those types of areas where you may be doing a procedure that you've done forever because it just feels like the right procedure. Mm -hmm. And so you may not be thinking about, is this really a material risk? Are, mm -hmm. are we exposed to a, a material misstatement in this, in this audit area? Mm -hmm. and, and the more that you do spend time thinking about like, what, what, what am I doing? Why am I doing this? The, the, the better your procedures are going to be in the end so that you are tailoring it to be specifically responsive to those things that are going to expose you to the most opportunities to miss misstatements. Right. And I, I think one of the challenges that firms are facing is I've always done it this way. Mm -hmm. And, you know, just same as last year. Let me just roll forward. So it is going to require a skill set, a, a skill set shift uh, mm -hmm. within seniors and even managers and partners right. is to really change how they're auditing uh, to really move that needle on both quality and, and then efficiency. Yeah. Well, I think one of the comments that uh, I believe it was Chris made when we were having a prep call for this, uh, this session, w which I thought was fascinating and, and so true, is that um, in the days when we did audits on paper and had all the work papers, you could dig down and you could drill down and you could see what was behind all the numbers in those papers because everything was there. And now with, um, with the, the way technology is taking over a lot of the, the more mundane or basic transactions that we do, you don't, you don't have that. Right. So it's, it's, it's making a big difference. Yeah, and it does, and it, and it definitely will. Uh, it is really important, and that, that's a topic that I mentioned before, is it, it will be really important for us as auditors and insurance providers to be really, really thoughtful of where that data that we're, we're relying on is coming from and how we really understand that it is reliable data. Mm -hmm. And so it really will open up the opportunity for people with different skill sets. You, may, you, you won't necessarily need as many people to file through papers. You may need somebody who really understands, all right, how does this technology work together? And that's a that's a skill set that's that can be really different than what our accounting staff or auditing staff have now. And so it, it is a it is a thing as we go forward that that I'm really interested to, to see how that really impacts our assurance firms. I know it, it can give you an opportunity also to open up a business line because your Absolutely. clients may not understand how that works either. And you may be able to say, hey, we, we have someone who is a professional in this area who really does understand this. And they can tell you and show you how this works. And we can, we can evaluate the control system that you have in place to make sure that the data that you're putting in is coming out in the way that makes the most sense. And so there are a lot of, uh, there, it's, a, it's scary because we're, we're changing, but at the same time, it's, a, it's exciting because we're changing. And, and we have these extra opportunities, all this different stuff that's coming forward. Yeah, I mean, I think there are solutions out there to kind of help you take that mentality to um, to your auto practice. Like, for example, I joined Walters Kluwer from Ernst & Young to design a risk-based audit methodology, which is Knowledge Coach. And what we did was we actually went through the standards, the risk assessment standards, to design this. And you are able to really design based on the data that you're bringing it in and drill down to that data throughout the entire uh, practice. And that's the big takeaway from this, you know, peer review standards, risk assessment. If you're in a firm right now and you look at an audit and all of your audits, you do like all 10 or 15 basic steps like stop, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> like Taylor, but each audit, and that's what the standards are telling us with the AICPA and FASB, they're all yeah. pushing is each audit you do as a firm should be different. 
exactly. if they're all the same, that should really only happen if like they're like the same company owned by the same person in like a different city. <laughs> yeah, sure. But even then, it's, you know, you need to go with the thought that they may be different. Yes, like and that's really the biggest takeaway of that is if all of your audits are the same, you're doing it wrong, stop. Mm -hmm. Each audit should be start to be more specific. Each one, just challenge yourself. Let's do one thing specific mm -hmm. on this audit. Just, just start small. Don't read the whole thing, but just do one specific audit yeah. test. Yeah, and I think, uh, I think even the standards require you to think about something that's unpredictable, that yeah. would be a, a little bit different, that, that would be a change. And so if you're, even if you're incorporating something that wasn't what you did before, but now is a little bit different, now, you're, now you can do it and say, hey, we're doing this unpredictability test. So you, you can even gain some, uh, some audit value from it. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. All right, we have one more quick commercial break that we need to take. Uh, we're going to take that right now, learn just a little bit more about Walters Kluwer, and when we come back, we'll have your final CPE code, and we have some final thoughts to wrap up the session. Having a standardized process across our office ensures that if you pick up a file from our Minneapolis office, from our Fargo office, whichever office that may be, if we're all following the same audit methodology, we know that we're always going to be in compliance with audit standards and also our firm policies and procedures. I think the integrated audit approach um, impacts quality, efficiencies, and effectiveness, just again, to have a cohesive product, we have one solution that has everything together. And that togetherness, I think, just eases a training aspect of it, eases promoting use of all the different tools that we have, and just gets people on board with not something else they have to learn, it's something that's going to make their audit better. The same suite of, of products, I think, just really helps, they speak to each other, they like each other, they work well with each other, and. Um, that's been very helpful. You're not always going outside engagement to run a separate application or having to bring something into your audit documentation is a really cohesive product. Knowledge Coach supports a statement that is uh, do the right thing and do the thing right. Anytime I have a question about methodology, audit you know, st steps in the programs. Why are we doing this? Why was that changed? The response I get back is rooted with audit standards. So to me, that means that they're not just adding items or changing items for the fun of it to make us, you know, do more work, but they really are trying to make sure that we're in compliance with audit standards. And so anytime that they're continually enhancing their products and making changes to make sure that we can get our job done correctly. Welcome back. Please make a note of the CPE code that you see on the bottom of your screen right now. This is your third code for this session, so uh, you've gotten all three of your codes, so when you're ready to collect your CPE at the end of the day or when you've finished all the sessions you're watching, those are the three codes, codes you'll need for this session to get your CPE credit. So there was a study that Walters Kluwer did um, in the last year. Uh, it was called the State of the Cloud Report, um, and they were uh, mapping what was what seemed to be the most pressing issues for accountants, and there was a comparison of how those issues have changed over the years, but these are the current most pressing issues according to this report, the top five pressing issues to accountants. The first is keeping current with technology. Mm -hmm. The next is growing the business. The next is service clients effectively and meet client expectations. Information security and security of data was fourth. And complete your work accurately and on time. So it seems to me, first of all, that, I mean, this raised a couple of, I think, interesting issues for me. Um, first of all, technological trends seem to be impacting all of these issues mm -hmm. that are foremost on accountants' minds. I thought um, the one here that, that really stood out for me, the meeting client expectations, that's where we really look at um, the why factor of why accountants are doing what they're doing. Um, the others are you know, trying to make sure they're doing it right, but why they're doing it and what it is, is they're doing it to make sure that their clients are satisfied and getting what they need from 
the engagement. So I think that's really interesting. But do we want to talk a little bit about how technology is playing a part in all this and how, you know, I'm not going to go back and read all the last six years, but things have changed quite a bit. Sure. I, I think the a, a pretty key understanding there is that clients understand that there's more data available. And now they want to be able to utilize it the same way we do. They want to be able to make their business more efficient. They want to be able to understand where they're missing the ball or where they have the, the right stuff in place or where they have the wrong stuff in place. And so they want us as, as their assurance provider to, to be an advisor and to give them an understanding of what, what technology do I need to be thinking about or what technology do I have that I need to use better. And so all of those things, data security, technology, growing our business, all of that comes back to serving clients and providing them with what they need. And right now, I think it is. It's definitely the case that our clients are wanting more understanding of how everything is impacting their business and, and expanding on that. Yeah, I mean, technology is growing at an exponential rate, which a lot of people don't even understand really what that means. Uh, but we've seen a trend where, you know, first it's I want to have my tasks automated. I want to support kind of a workflow to I want to be able to have my firm on, a, on the one platform. Um, and now being able to ha introduce um, emerging technologies such as artificial intelligence and machine learning. So a lot of that is happening really at that exponential rate. And so if firms don't look at technology and really make a, a plan for change, they're gonna have a really steep hill to climb if they don't start thinking, but what can I do now? How can I start leveraging data uh, so that you're ready for the machine learning and the artificial intelligence? Mm -hmm. Yeah, how do we be better auditors? We gotta leverage technology. And remember too, like we don't exist in a vacuum anymore. Like you said, Kathy, technology is moving so fast and guess what? That also means that your clients are where it's moving so fast. Right. So you can't just sit back and say, I don't need to get more efficient at the audit. I don't need to bring in AI and machine learning and tools to my audit. My clients never get to think about that. Yeah, 15 years ago, they weren't hearing about trends in our industry. Now, technology is moving so fast. The yeah, last thing you want is clients your, expect that from Yeah, the last thing you want is your right. client to be like, hey, like, are you, are you using like AI in the audit? Like, why is my audit so taking so long? And you'd be like, um, <laughs> I don't know. Like, what do you, what do you, what do you, what do you know about AI? And like, well, like, you know, here's like three solutions in AI. Like, do you use any of these? And you're like, no, but like, please give me that piece of paper. And we'll go back <laughs> and like, like that can happen now. So you got to stay on top yeah. of it. Be a better auditor. Stay on top of technology. Definitely. I do think that's absolutely true. That the more you're on top of what's happening in not just in the accounting profession but the marketplace as a whole the better you're going to be at doing your job and being able to help your clients do theirs so here's just one question to throw out for you as we close um, uh, think about this We're, we've talked about how things are changing rapidly and how they're going to be changing even more rapidly and stay tuned till next to next session i just want to throw in a teaser for that because we're going to be talking about really crystal ball stuff, you know, what we see happening mm -hmm. in, the, in the future. But um, in terms of what's happening right now and what we see going on with technology and other trends, is the CPA firm, the concept of a CPA firm, is that going to change? Is, that, is it not going to be accounting firms anymore? Is it going to be more, as we move to advisory and technology and bringing in lots of people who aren't necessarily CPAs into the... Um, the mix of the what still is a traditional accounting for workplace is it? Do you envision it? I mean, I know we don't need answers, but do just you want, speculation. Do you want the long or short answer? <laughs> In a couple minutes. So. I mean, absolutely. It's going to absolutely change. It's already starting to change. Like, if you were to put your hat on as an accountant and think like, my firm will be the same today. In one, two, three, five years, you can choose to be the same, but you're not going to be successful, and you're going to struggle. Like it's changing in so many ways from remote staffing, the service we provide, the technology we use. I mean, just talk to anybody that exists in the accounting technology space. It's moving so fast, and they're doing so much impressive stuff. Just talking to Kathy before we went online, <laughs> hearing the things they're doing that aren't just like theoretical, like she thinks it'd be cool to do, things that like they're actually doing, doing yeah. are real and coming fast. So it's, it's absolutely changed, and you can either change with that or well, I wonder too if it's, um, is it accounting firms as we're bringing in people who are not accountants to mm -hmm. round out our, our workforce? Is it that accounting firms are going to change into something else or are 
advisory firms that didn't even start as accounting firms going to grow up and maybe bring in accountants to round out their workforce? Mm. I think it's probably more like we're going to bring them in and change to be like them. We can learn more from them than they can really learn from us. <laughs> we're being honest. Like, it'd be great to think that we are the greatest profession in the world and we know more than everybody else. Most likely, we're going to learn from them as okay. we bring them in with it. All right. Any other final thoughts? I mean, I think in the short term, for sure, the accounting firm, what it looks like today is changing with cloud technology. You're not going to have everybody in the office. You can work from anywhere uh, with for that one accounting firm. You may not always have to go to the client's office um, like you used to be able to do, dragging bankers' boxes. <laughs> I mean, that's what Chris and I were talking about yeah. before. So I think that's the short term. I mean, I think at the end, the accounting firm may look different. Um, it's really going to come down to how can stakeholders get reliance on an audit and you know does an audit firm have to provide that or can they get that reliance some way else mm -hmm. uh, so I think that's really where we're going yeah. all right well we're going to be looking into that crystal ball in the next session so please come back thank you all for being with us this session thank you Walters Kluwer for sponsoring this session uh, and thank you great panel once again this is really super so uh, we will see you uh, in just a few minutes after we change the setup a little bit. Don't go away. <laughs>